So we have to ultimately look at the data of like what happens in humans when they consume foods that contain phytic acid. And what we see in humans when they consume foods that contain phytic acid is they tend to live longer with less disease. People might put a blanket you know, anti-nutrient term over a lot of these things. And if you really get down to the granular, there's very few people that actually know the mechanisms and know what's actually happening enough to be able to take a solid stance. They just, you know, we are tribal creatures. We tend to like to subscribe to a way of thinking. And sometimes, you know, I myself have had to kind of turn corners with this too and understand that, hey, I need to actually understand what phytic acid is. I yep. need to just understand what it does inside a mammal's body. And uh, with that, I'll kind of turn it to you. I mean, can we kind of break them down? Like, let's start with phytic acid because I think that's one of the more popular ones that people know about. After today's video, if you are trying to change your lifestyle or make any change to your diet, one of the most important things you can focus on is your gut. So that is a 25% off discount link for Seed. That is a daily symbiotic. So they're a big sponsor on this channel. If you wanna say thank you to this channel, the best way you can do that is supporting our sponsors that allow us to do what we do. So this is a capsule inside of a capsule technology with a prebiotic and a probiotic. So when you take it, you get the potential like proper colonization, the proper staging of the prebiotics and then the probiotics going where they're potentially supposed to go. So anyway, that link saves you 25% off your entire order with them. So make sure you check them out if you're looking for a good probiotic. And again, it's literally the only probiotic I recommend, literally the only one, because most of them out there are a couple of strains and are a complete nonsense. So that link is down below underneath this video. Phytic acid classically found in, in seeds nuts, uh, legumes, and, um, and so phytic acid is like, the concern is that it could bind up minerals and make it so that you don't get access to those minerals. But yet, like uh, people who consume diets that are high in phytic acid, do we discover that they have these nutritional deficiencies, that they are more prone to having some sort of mineral deficiency as a result of their phytic acid intake? The answer is no, I haven't seen any evidence that convinces me that that is in fact the case when you are eating a balanced diet. And the reason why is because those foods that you know contain phytic acid, guess what? They also contain minerals and many times more amounts of those minerals. And so as a result of that, the phytic acid and the minerals, they're just in balance. But you know, it's also important for people to keep in mind that like the, these plants are not just vehicles to deliver phytic acid. They contain a number of different things that are in there. Fiber and phytochemicals and polyphenols. And these things all are mixed together and having a unique effect on our body. So looking at phytic acid in a test tube or in an animal model in isolation is not the same as me eating a handful of nuts. That's not even close. So we have to ultimately look at the data of like what happens in humans when they consume foods that contain phytic acid. And what we see in humans when they consume foods that contain phytic acid is they tend to live longer with less disease. And when you dig into the details of like, you know, what's going on there, what we think at this point is that phytic acid actually has a number of unique benefits. So it seems to be anti-inflammatory, um, antioxidant, so it reduces oxidative stress in the body. Um, so the, the, this, this appears to be the reason why like phytic acid shouldn't necessarily be something that we're scared of. Now, that being said, like there are ways, there are strategies that you can use to reduce the phytic acid content in your food. Um, one of them is to ferment it. So like uh, if you take uh, flour and you ferment it and you create sourdough, it's substantially lower in both phytic acid and also gluten content. Um, another way is to soak. You can soak your legumes or soak your seeds and nuts and by soaking them, you actually are removing the phytic acid in the process of doing that. Interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, and people, uh, you said something that was very important there, said when you eat a balanced diet, you know, let's pretend for a second that, um, you know, you ate some, something that was high in phytic acid. Let's pretend for a second that that is going to completely uh, chelate and lock up all the minerals that they cannot be absorbed. If that were the case, and that was happening in a snapshot in time, I know enough about nutrition to know that the effect of everything else that you're eating can vastly supersede that and sort of balance out that effect or counterbalance it even more, right? Yeah. So if you were only eating cashews or only eating you know, nuts as your source of nutrition, then perhaps you could make that argument that, you know, yes, the X percentage of the minerals that you're consuming might be bound up. But if you're right. eating a wide array of foods, 
then that becomes a moot point because as a sort of uh, percentage of what you're taking in, it's not like you have this much phytic acid and it's gonna lock up all the minerals from this much food. Yeah, well, and also you have one meal that happens to be like excessively high in phytic acid. And let's pretend that hypothetically that one meal does actually deplete your body of some of these minerals. Let's pretend it does. Guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna eat another meal. <laughs> and most likely, if you're eating a balanced diet, it's not going to continue to be some sort of arrangement, and this is like completely theoretical, but it's not going to continue to be some sort of arrangement that depletes your body of, of these, uh, these minerals. So, you know, again, what I come back to is, um, first of all, where is the evidence that people who eat a high phytic acid diet are actually uh, nutritional deplete or are suffering from mineral deficiencies? I haven't seen that. Okay, so let's jump over, uh, you know, there's obviously the big uh, elephant in the room that people like to address, and that's the world of lectins. Yeah. Um, I am a fan of a modified, people always ask, like, what style do I eat? I eat what I call a modified Mediterranean diet, because I eat a fair bit cool. of protein. So I take a Mediterranean diet, and I do increase the protein intake because yep. of my specific goals. So uh, for the most part, it's the, my carbohydrate sources are going to be things like uh, lentils, fair bit of legumes, fruits, veggies, that's really my carbohydrate source. Uh, and then, you know, a fair bit of lean proteins, usually opt for leaner cuts. So that's my diet in a nutshell, and a fair bit of like kefir and cottage cheese and stuff like that. Nice. Point is, is that uh, I come under fire a lot, specifically because of the, uh, you know, lentils and things like that. Okay, if you're talking lectins, Thomas, like, is that going to really destroy you? And I had to stop and think, like, okay, should I just eliminate the, le uh, the legumes and all the lentils? Bottom line is, I've never had any issue with it. Yeah. Uh, and as far as lectins are concerned, that's a very hot button issue. What's sort of the stance there? Yeah, yeah, so I wanna, I wanna walk through this because there's a couple things that are really important for people to understand. First of all, lectins are ubiquitous in nature, meaning that all uh, living creatures, including plants, including humans, including me and you and the people that are listening to us, including the microbes that are a part of our body, they all produce lectins. It's, these are like signaling molecules that exist in nature and they play a relevant role. Um, now, uh, the evidence that lectins cause trouble for humans comes in two forms. And I just wanna debunk these two forms of evidence. The first is that it comes from test tubes, test tube studies, where you take some inordinate concentration of lectins in isolation and then you uh, apply it to like some cells that you swirl around in a, in a little swirly. That is not the same as you and I consuming lentils. It's not even close. So we have to be very careful about translating a test tube study and accepting that as gospel. And when, like, when we consume lentils, it's not just lectins. It's lectins on a minor level, which is gonna be my second point, but also with fiber and polyphenols and resistant starches and minerals and vitamins and all these other wonderful things that are really good for us. Okay, the second point is that when we, uh, uh, I mentioned there's two pieces of evidence that lectins are problematic. The second one has to do when people consume undercooked food. Because if you take like the main place where lectins exist and plants are legumes. And if you take you know, kidney beans, and you don't adequately cook them, then they will be higher in lectins. And there are two examples in the medical literature throughout history in the, in the last 40 years where there, were, there was food poisoning as a result of consuming excessive amounts of lectins. In both cases, it was because they hadn't cooked the food. And in both cases, no one was actually hurt. They consumed too many lectins, they got acute food poisoning, and then they were back to work the next day. No one was hospitalized. So this um, sort of idea that lectins are so dangerous and threatening to us, well, if you cook your food, which quite simply when we're talking about legumes, it just means boiling them, or alternatively using a pressure cooker, but that's not even required, you can just boil them. You are removing the lectins, and like you are removing them to a point that they are undetectable or completely inconsequential. I mean, we're almost having the uh, anti-fragile concept discussion here, you know, because you can take this anti-fragile concept discussion and apply it to anywhere. It's like, if you are trying to avoid every little possible thing that might try to kill you, then you may as well be living in a bubble. Right. And it's the same thing. So 
Uh, and I then you would actually get more sick as a result. Exactly. exactly. So the anti-fragile concept for me, it's like I, I do subscribe to a lot of that notion, even though sometimes it's extreme, but it's like you have to expose yourself to stress. And at a, like even a military level, a lot of times they, exp you know, you don't default to your, uh, you, you don't, you don't default to the highest level of training. You default to the lowest level of training, right? You don't default to say, I'm going to rise to the occasion. You're going to default to your lowest level of training. And what that essentially means in a non-military application is like, even with our bodies, if we are constantly babying ourselves, <clears throat> that's like saying like, I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm sanitizing my hands all the time. I'm washing my hands all the time. I don't want any because I don't want to get sick. My, it's my thought process with food too. I think you do need to, now hyper palatable foods are completely different situation, processed foods, different ball game altogether. But as far as whole foods, yep. you do need to, at least in moderation, expose yourself to these things so that you can develop the ability to A, deal with them, but build some resiliency. It's almost like training with a weight vest on. If lectins are mildly poisonous to us, but they are also naturally occurring in existence, and we have a perfectly capable uh, ability to deal with them, then it would make sense that having them in moderation might actually make us more resilient humans. That's purely hypothetical, but it's sort of how I look at this whole thing. Well, and I also think the dose makes the disease, right? So in the sense that um, you and I, we, we breathe oxygen and we need oxygen to sustain our life and without it, we would die. But actually, uh, if you take a patient to the hospital and I've done this at least hundreds of times and they're in the intensive care unit and you give them 100% oxygen, which by the way is necessary for some people who are extremely sick. That's actually toxic. 100% oxygen is actually toxic. Yet it's like the thing that we need to survive and to live. Now I'm not sitting here making the argument that we need lectins in order to live. That's not the argument. But when you take a little fractional baby dose of lectins, that's completely different than eating uncooked kidney beans. And that amount can have a different effect on your body. And the evidence actually suggests, Thomas, that low, low doses, the sort of micro dosing of lectins that you get from consuming legumes, cooked lentils and whatnot, um, that it's not inflicting harm. If anything, it's actually protecting you. It's actually to your benefit. In fact, if, and I encourage the people who are watching this, go and check out PubMed. Go to PubMed, type in the word lectin and see what pops up. And what you're gonna see is a ton of studies that are talking about how lectins protect us from cancer. And that's because, once again, it's completely different when you consume lentils, which have a small amount of lectins compared to something in a test tube where you're concentrating the lectins in isolation. That's completely unnatural. So, you know, the last argument that I would really say with the lectins before we move on, because I have to say this, is like the fact that there are people who make the claim that lectins are responsible for all of our major diseases is comically sad to me. It is comically sad because do you know how many, how much beans we consume on a yearly basis in the United States? No. Six pounds. Six pounds. So if you were to take this and like average it out on a daily basis, I would be dropping a couple of beans onto your plate on a daily basis. That's it, right? That's a joke. That is, there's no way that that is what's inflicting harm on our body. You want to talk about sugar or a number of different things from our dietary perspective that are inflicting harm on our body? We can have that conversation, but don't tell me the thing that we're only eating six pounds of is our major problem. 